Last, uh, last Wednesday at morning prayer, uh, the reading was another reading from James, uh, James 3. I just wanted to read you the first couple of verses. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for all of us make many mistakes. Uh, when I, I probably have told you this, but <clears throat> not a made up story for a sermon. Uh, when, I, when I was ordained, when I got the letter, I wish my mom was here to testify to that. When I got the letter from the bishop saying that he intended to ordain me on a certain day, it's all very formal. I kind of stared at it, and honestly, I thought, what kind of church would ordain somebody like me? I, I, I thought, <laughs> honestly, and I got ordained. Yeah, I'm sure you love to hear this, right? Your priest, right? Hey, hey, hey. I got ordained, and my parents had some people over. And I got to bed very late, and honestly, I, I, I think I was asleep five or ten minutes, and then I woke up with a panic attack. And the reason I was panicked was because of this verse. Um, those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And I, and I realized that I have decades ahead of me to be a priest. And if I do not preach what's in the gospel, it puts my soul at hazard. And, uh, and more importantly, it puts everyone else's as well. So it's important to preach what is put in front of you from the Bible. Um, the gospel is the single most important thing ever written down, inspired by God, given to human beings. And for all of us, it's important that we look at it uh, not through our own lens. Why? Because we are terrible at judging people and things. We are terrible at doing it. Um, and we're especially bad at judging people. And, and this is what um, James is getting at here uh, that Dave was reading. My brothers and sisters, uh, do you with acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? And he goes on. If any of you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please. While to the one who is poor and in rags, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? People love beautiful people. And people love very competent and talented people. We, we, just, we just do. We, if somebody, you know, is strong and, and, and good looking and, you know, secretly you hate them. Uh, but, but, you know, you also admire them and you listen to them and you want to be around them and, um, and I'm not speaking of myself of course. Uh, <laughs> but we're, we're bad at judging people I, there's a song, I, I made the mistake of listening, it's a guilty pleasure it's not a very good band but it's a great song from way back from a band called the Northern Pikes I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this band and, okay, and there we go do you know the, the, their best song what it's called? Yeah, yeah. She she ain't pretty. She just looks that way. <laughs> best best title for a song ever. She ain't pretty. She just looks that way. And it goes to show men, men especially, will go to the ends of the earth for a beautiful woman who treats them like garbage. And other women who are actually good women are always baffled by that. How are men that stupid? We just are, right? If she's a model, I'm gonna try to be with her, and she can treat me like garbage. Well, that's when you're younger, right? You eventually, hopefully, grow out of that. But have you ever looked at your old, I don't know if you, I don't know if you, they even do them anymore, class pictures, do they still, I don't think they still do them, but they take a picture of the whole class, those of you who are older, and you may, I have a few at home, right? And I could name you probably half the kids in it, but you look at those pictures and you think, those kids are on the launch pad. You have no idea what their lives are going to be like. And then you go through public school, elementary school, and then high school, and then, you know, they don't do it anymore, but they vote that they're most likely to succeed. But everybody knew when you graduated who was going to be successful and those poor kids that weren't. And now that 57, that was almost universally wrong. There were kids I graduated with, you were sure, 
were going to fall on their faces and just go into obscurity and be depressed. And five years after graduation, some of them did incredibly well. I'm not talking about money. I'm just talking about pursuing their dreams and going after things. And then other people I thought were going to be crazy successful didn't do anything. There was a guy who played on our rugby team uh, uh, named Al Sharon, super nice guy. Baby kid, 6'5", graduating high school, he's a big kid. But in rugby, he was a lock forward, if you know rugby. Um, he was nobody special on the team. He's average, average player. <coughs> Al Sharon went on to be universally regarded in the world as one of the top lock forwards when he was playing. Like top five in the world when he was playing. Right? Nobody had a clue. Nobody who played with him had a clue. All of a sudden, he hit 20, 19, 20, just boom, took off. I also had another friend, good-looking guy, uh, always the fastest, always the strongest, and a good-looking guy. You just love to hate him. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. All the girls love this guy. When? No. Just after school, he just seemed to falter somehow. Socially, and I'm not, once again, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about a person's passion to pursue whatever they want to do. And we're terrible at judging that. I'm not going to ask you to shout out, but I wrote down, now this is actually scientists who've done studies on this, top eight predictors of future success in people. Take, looking at kids, <laughs> tracking them as they get older, what are the top eight factors? Just think in your head what, what, what traits a person would have to have. Because seven of them are self-evident when I say them. The eighth one is not. So first one, conscientiousness. If you're a psychology buff, it's the ocean top five personality traits. They're very good at predicting what type of personality you're going to have. Uh, oh boy, I'm going to fall down on this one. Openness to expression, conscientiousness, extroversion. I wrote it down. Agreeableness and neuroticism. Right? So if you are conscientious with a low level of neuroticism, you're probably going to do pretty well if you're intelligent as well. Um, ability to delay gratification. We've talked about this one before. The ability to work towards something for months, possibly years, without seeing a return on it. Some people need to see the return immediately or they'll stop. Those people don't tend to do as well. Belief in free will, the ability to make decisions. Being in an open network of people. Now this is diversity, but not diversity of anything else other than opinion and thought. That is a problem we have today. Because if I go online, I can make sure I only hear opinions that validate my opinion. Whereas in the past, in your work and in your neighborhood, you were forced to listen to diverse opinions, right? It's important to be in an open network. Avid reading. Past success is a good predictor of future success. Grit. Stick to it. -ness. Being able to stick with something. And here's the eighth one. Anybody know what it is? Childhood adversity. Specifically, you want to know the top puts you like, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up this stat, but 10 to 15 times I think it is more likely to succeed. Death of a parent before the age of 13. And you would never guess that. And no one, what does everybody say with kids? Or almost everybody. I don't want them to have to go through the sort of strife that I had to go through when I was growing up. And if you go too far with that, you do everything for them. Parents now, I kid you not, 30% of the time show up with their adult kids to job interviews. <laughs> you are not getting that job the very second you walk in the door with your mom. <laughs> that job is gone. Other people call it friction. Friction in life. Resistance against your will. Failing in sport. You are looking at a guy who failed in sport more than I would like to admit. 
I was on teams that would go an entire season without winning, right? And I hated it. Didn't want to play. Da, da, da. But then when I finally, the last hockey team I was ever on, Midget Hockey, we won the entire year. We went undefeated almost that entire year. I think we lost the first game of the season, undefeated, and then rolled through the championship. All of us, do you know what team it was? I can't, not, not a lie. They had too many kids. Too many kids had come out and they, they were recruiting too many kids. So they needed, I don't know what it was, a 14th team or whatever. So they asked all the other teams to send one or two players over. So of course, they sent all of their misfit toys. <laughs> and it just so happened that the misfit toys all fit together incredibly well. Of which I was one, asthmatic. <laughs> First period, breakaways. Second period, I just kept up. Third period, on the bench. That was me all season long. Uh, once again, we're terrible at judging. We're terrible at judging. And all the way through these readings, the good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver and gold. That's from Proverbs. The one I read to you... Uh, uh, from James, uh, sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and because become judges with evil thoughts? And then Jesus here, these two people, who one who comes to him, the other one is brought to him. The Syrophoenician woman is a Gentile, and Jesus says, as a lesson, because people go, well, Jesus was in a bit of a mood. Jesus was having. A, Jesus never uttered a word that wasn't calculated. Wasn't calculated. He knew exactly what everybody else was thinking. He said it. You know, uh, let the children be fed first. It's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Basically, get out of here. I'm going to take care of all the Jews first, and then if we have time, maybe we'll do something for you people. The woman shows her faith, says, even the dogs will eat the crumbs from the table of those children. And seeing her faith, like Jesus always does, says, Go, your faith has made your daughter well. Then they bring to him somebody who's an outcast. An outcast because people used to attribute illness with sin. If you were born blind or lame or you couldn't speak, it was because you or your parents had sinned. That's the way people in the ancient world, all ancient societies, that's why all these people were outcasts. Often from their own home they were cast out. Living on the street, hand to mouth, begging for food. They bring this man to a deaf man who had an impediment of speech. Begged him to lay his hands upon him. The faith of the friends, we're not told what the faith of the deaf man was. We're only told that the faith of the people who actually brought him was strong. And once again, that faith is the active agent, that vehicle of grace that allows that healing to take place. Jesus, when we talk about seeing the world the way Jesus does, it's the ability to see human beings for what they are, equal children of God. If it helps you, it did for me. Um, I, my, my degree is in pastoral theology, which is, which is an active, practical form of theology that hopefully works in the world. And I spent an awful lot of time in, in seniors' residences and, and homes and hospices. And like many of you, it is difficult to watch. Illness and death is ugly. It, it's ugly. Like I said at the beginning, we like to look at beautiful things. It's the reason for art galleries. We don't like to look at ugly things, even if they're people. And... I thought, I've got to get past this, because look, I'm going to be brutal for a second. If you've ever visited a hospice, places like that even have a smell. Don't they? Let's be honest. They have a smell to them. It's very unpleasant. You know, people are suffering. People are struggling. Sweat. Blood. Other things. Right? <clears throat> I started to look at people and I, I, there was a picture by somebody's bed, I remember this like it was yet, it was taken a long time ago, of this person as a child. <clears throat> and I thought, you know what, the person in front of me is still that child. 
Not to infantilize an adult, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you know, we even in our movies, right? What are the two rules? What don't you kill? You can have a serial killer in a movie, right? There's two things that people will dislike a movie. You can kill all the adults you want. Don't kill a kid and don't kill a dog. People will get very upset. The dog has to escape the situation. We're okay with like dozens of adults being killed because we forget. That child, that spark, that child of God is, is in everybody around us. And it's the ability, our ability to see that and not the shell of the circumstance the person is in. As soon as I started thinking in those terms, the, the ugliness just dropped away. And then all I saw was just somebody struggling. Um, because the rest of it was me, right? That was my lens. That was my discomfort. That's not why I'm there. That's not why we go, right? That's not what we're about. It's about being able to see past that, seeing everybody, the Syrophoenician women around us, the deaf and mute people around us, those dying, those who are older, those who are sick, seeing them for what they are and not as the world sees them. 